So what we're going to do today, Mike Sobin is going to show up in a minute, the nurse practitioner, I'm sure everybody knows. So we, we decided to have some fun for ourselves at this time. So he'll show up and we'll, we'll give you a, the, um, a little back and forth discussion. Um, the, originally, we were going to talk this time about lumbar spine. Since last time we talked about cervical spine, except Mike made the talk. And it has everything in it, so I just said, oh, then we'll just talk about everything today. Um, and we'll, we will intentionally be a little bit repetitive since adult learning is by repetition. <laughs> Remember, adult learning is by repetition. <laughs> so, get right into it. You guys know what that is. What you don't know in our office is Dr. Musso. Some of you may know him from old days, JFK, whatnot. But he is a board certified fellowship trained spine surgeon. He's about a year older than me. And when the orthopedic center down by JFK did its implosion years ago, back when there was this big practice acquisition back in the late 90s. And now, of course, we're seeing that happen, happening again 15 years later. But his group was at it. He decided after 20 years of practice to retire. That got very boring. So he called me up a few years ago. And we weren't partners back then. He said, look, I'm bored. Can I come work in your office? So he works in our office and sees patients and treats them. He's the nicest person in our office, by the way. <laughs> Way nicer than me and Dr. Gold. And uh, so we're, we're pleased to have him. Dr. Gold, I think everybody probably knows now, he has been here almost two years now. My surgeon like me. Okay, Mike, okay, everybody knows Brittany, because she was one of you, right? <laughs> we stole her away before Dr. Gorman could get her, which is great. <laughs> and we're training Brittany up to work in the operating room now. So even though she's in the office most, you guys see her doing rounds and wonderful addition. So what I thought we would do is I'm going to go through the different types of surgeries. And then if Mike gets here, he'll talk some about the post-op plan since, as you know, most of the, the hospital patient management tends to, in our practice, tends to be delegated to nurse practitioners and with our careful oversight, which is the evolution of healthcare. It's where it's what it is, and it's actually probably better than the way it was 10 or 15 years ago. Spine surgery at Jupiter Medical Center is busy. Jupiter Medical Center is the busiest spine surgery facility on the, in South Florida. There, there's, there's more spine surgery done here than at all of the other hospitals that you could name. And that is a reflection of the quality of care on the floor, the quality of care in the OR. And that's what draws surgeons to the hospital. It's not that there are great surgeons here. It's that the hospital works really well. And so everybody, all my competition, they come here. So everybody's showing up at Jupiter more and more as time goes on because it is, um, gives a lot of patient satisfaction and quality. So the complication rates low because complication rates are linked to the number of cases in an operating room that are done. Everybody knew that from hip and knee surgery. It was talked about in the news years ago, published, but it's intuitively we all do that anyhow. The more you do something, the more efficient everybody becomes, the more skilled uh, people are as they learn protocols and learn what to expect. So at Jupiter Hospital, spine surgery is, is runs as smoothly as at any other hospital in South Florida, I'm sure. Spine surgery includes cervical, thoracic, and lumbosacral. Last year we talked a lot about cervical spine. We went through definitions of terms like myelopathy, radiculopathy, dysphagia, dysphonia, speech problems. We have a patient right now in the ICU who woke up with dysphonia and dysphagia. We 
kept him intubated, and then we re-operated on him, kept him intubated for a while, and his dysphonia, which is a hoarse voice or, or altered pitch or tone, has improved. I thought that I had injured his recurrent laryngeal nerve, paralyzing his vocal cord. But, but when uh, we found that as his swelling and hematoma resolved, his voice came back to what normal enough to know that the vocal cords are working. So that's dysphonia. Dysphagia, which can be linked to dysphonia, dysphagia is difficulty swallowing. Everybody that has cervical spine surgery from the front, by every surgeon, has some dysphagia. And we can downplay it because it happens to everybody. It tends to get better day by day and in the vast majority of patients resolves completely. And in the occasional patient, we will have, especially the longer the operation, the more levels that are involved, or like in this patient that we're speaking of, who just left the ICU yesterday, this patient had had a carotid artery operation. So you can imagine the concrete wooden tissue that was in there. His dysphagia is actually improving. But some patients will be left with a Weird, hey Mike, a weird, you come on up here, a peculiar problem <laughs> forever where certain size pills will get stuck. And that's a, that's about the worst, but we've never had anybody starve to death after a, a cervical spine operation. But that kind of issue. So what we'll do, Mike, I'm going to go through the types of surgeries and then I'm going to let you talk about all the rest of this. Okay, right, okay. We have anterior and posterior cervical spine surgery. We have anterior thoracic surgery. We don't do much of that because that would require a thoracotomy, which nobody wants to do unless forced. You can have thoracoscopic spine surgery from the front of the thorax, but it's rare. It, there are only a few centers in the country who will do thoracoscopic, thoracoscopic anterior thoracic spine surgery because it's dangerous. It is, uh, has a steep learning curve. And the reason that most of us can't or won't do it, we don't want to learn how to do it because the learning curve is too steep. And in the first few cases of a steep learning curve, people have complications. And in South Florida, you can't have a complication. For you to get sued. South Florida, you can't have a complication. So if we have somebody that needs anterior thoracic spine surgery, we pick one or two centers, uh, gentlemen across the country that do this, and we convince the patient to buy a plane ticket and off they go and happen a couple times a year and do what we set people away. Posterior thoracic surgery, Dr. Golsch a couple weeks ago did a patient with metastatic breast cancer to the thoracic spine and did a major stabilizing thoracic surgery with thoracic pedicle screws and lumbar pedicle screws, something that 10 or 15 years ago was only done in Japan and the rare major institution now commonplace. And so we are fortunate to have Dr. Golsch available, very skilled, com coming out of Stanford, able to do such advanced cancer surgery at Jupiter Medical Center. And given that, as you all know, we're going to have a giant cancer center at Jupiter Medical Center, <coughs> that seems like a nice adjunct to what we have. Lumbar spine, anterior, posterior, and we include the sacrum every time we talk about lumbar sacral spine surgery. And the, the most common operation you'll see in an older person is a laminectomy where we remove the lamina back uh, shelf or roof of the spinal canal. If there's just a fragment of disc or a piece of bone that may be hitting a nerve, we may do something less than that where we leave the lamina intact but partially remove disc or bone spurs. That's called a hemilaminectomy or a hemilaminotomy. If you have somebody with a microdiscectomy, that means we just made a little keyhole to go in and take out a piece of disc and we're using the euphemism of micro to make it sound like it's smaller. <laughs> and soon, oh, it is, and soon, 
endoscopic, laparoscopic, bloodless, <laughs> no touch, surgery. <laughs> laser, laser. Generally speaking, that's called a lumbar. Anything time you take pressure off of a nerve, whether it's a laminectomy, which may be a big operation over multiple levels, or a microdiscectomy with an operating microscope, or, or soon you're going to see the endoscope used a lot at Jupiter, as soon as they buy it. <laughs> there. Okay, that's coming. Lumbar fusion is when we add bone graft to the procedure to result in a long term stabilizing effect of what we believe to have been an unstable segment. And then we have cervical decompression fusion, hypoplasty. I think it's worth, on number two, talking about lumbar fusion. It, the majority of patients that walk in our office, before we tell them what they need, they tell us, I don't want a fusion. And we have had plenty of patients who need a fusion because for, in certain instances, which I will tell you what they are, it's the standard of care. Frank Eismott, who is the leading spine surgeon at University of Miami, has trained half of the surgeons in Florida, including me, in an article about a month ago, published on a, a review, a review article on lumbar spondylolisthesis. He described lumbar fusion as the standard of care three times in the article. The legal term standard of care, which we all don't like to hear that term, it was in his article three times. So if you have certain spinal conditions, like an unstable lumbar spondylolisthesis, the standard of care is to do a fusion, except every patient that walks in our office, as soon as you say that word, fusion, they get a tingle up their spine and their face goes blank and they, you think they're having a vagal episode, so you land down, let them sniff something and everything's fine. Um, but there, there are still instances when a lumbar fusion is appropriate to add to the operation where we're decompressing the nerves. It, it perhaps has been overused in the past, perhaps. It is still perhaps overused, but the, the rules and regulations that are becoming more and more onerous from insurance companies and from Medicare make it more and more difficult to inappropriately or excessively do spine fusion because the guidelines that are published that we have to follow when seeking authorization from an insurer or Florida, when seeking payment for the hospital through what's called the limited coverage determination that Medicare published last year for lumbar fusion, where there are, there's a list of about six things that have to be followed <coughs> Before, and they have to be in the hospital record before Medicare will pay the hospital <coughs> facility fee. And they, and they won't pay the facility fee, before, and they won't pay the surgeon if you haven't followed these guidelines. So you can be sure that we all follow them, and in fact the hospital has somebody that looks at our history and physical before the patient comes in and says, nope, you, have, you don't have everything in there, you can't come yet. Or, yes, you have everything in there, we think it's okay. Cervical decompression and fusion. That's the most common thing that I do now. But that's a reflection of having Dr. Golish here because he's doing more of the lumbar decompression because my back hurts when I have to lean over like this. <laughs> and so I've got a nice new guy who can do this Cervical decompression is the procedure typically from the front, but you can do a cervical decompression from behind because the, by definition, what we're trying to do is take pressure off of the nerve, whether it's the spinal cord, neural tissue, or the cervical nerve root, neural tissue. So we can do that from the front, we can do that from behind. 
the results are more predictable in the majority of patients when we do it from the front and the neck because the spinal cord being a large structure that's solid and is delicate neural tissue like brain <laughs> tissue is some tissue that cannot be touched when you're doing surgery like brain tissue. When the neurosurgeons are doing brain surgery, they're not in there retracting things out of the way too much. You can't, you, just like in the neck, you cannot retract the spinal cord. So if you have a condition where the spinal cord is being compressed from the front, you have to get to it from the front. And that just happens to be a more common condition that requires surgery. 50 years ago, they did cervical laminectomy more often from behind because they didn't know how to do discectomy yet in the front. But now that, that has changed a lot. If you have to do a cervical laminectomy, often you will do a fusion from behind to stabilize the spine so that you don't wind up like that. Patients with kyphosis after having a laminectomy. That happens. It doesn't happen as often now because it's not done as commonly. Last week, Dr. Biscop and I had a discussion. You guys know Dr. Biscop does very fine microsurgical lumbar decompression. And there is a gentleman well known to everybody in the world named Dr. Joe in Pittsburgh, Allegheny Hospital, where he's world famous for doing anterior cervical discectomy decompression without fusion. So we're all working on maybe learning how to do that somewhat advanced, delicate technique to avoid fusion. Although I have to say, fusion in the, in the neck is nothing like fusion in the back. The therapists know for sure. Cervical fusion, lumbar fusion, it's like two different planets of recovery. Um, the cervical fusion surgery would be much easier. Kyphoplasty. <clears throat> Kyphoplasty is an injection of bone cement into an osteoporotic fractured vertebrae. And it is preceded, the injection of cement is preceded by percutaneous placement of a hydraulic balloon that goes in deflated, goes into the fractured vertebrae from behind, and then we inflate the balloon hydraulically, fluid, it expands, it theoretically reduces the fracture. It doesn't do that much, but it does that a little bit. More importantly, makes a cavity in the bone that has broken. The cavity, because you've crunched the bone open through this expanding balloon, it has a little teeny bit of a shell of bone inside, just as you could imagine. If you stuck a balloon, a water balloon, in a uh, bowl of cornflakes that are dry, and then you inflated the balloon, but you inflated the balloon, <coughs> the inner shell of that cavity would have a little crunched cornflakes around it. That's what we inject the cement into, and that minimizes the chance that the cement will extrude. Dr. Fox does a similar procedure called vertebroplasty. The only difference there is they don't put the balloon in first. They, under x-ray or CAT scan guidance, go in with a bone cement that is less viscous, more liquid, and they inject it in under a little higher pressure and it will fill the bone that way. Which is better. Which is better. It depends on who you ask. If you ask Dr. Fox, he would tell you that he likes vertebroplasty because it gets a better fill and it's quicker, easier, and it's definitely much, much cheaper because you, the, the product, the tools that go along with kyphoplasty are a little inflated in their price. And so the hospital, I don't know if they make any money, they may not. Not that that's the answer to the question, but it's relevant. So if you could do something, at, if you can do something with identical outcomes and one is cheaper than the other, nowadays in 2014, the, it is important to do the less expensive procedure. The problem is the Orthopedic Academy in 2013 published a set of guidelines for different procedures that have different levels of scientific validity and basis. Kyphoplasty got a moderate 
positive uh, acknowledgement. Vertebroplasty got a don't do it acknowledgement based on their review of the evidence-based medicine literature that's out there. But that's the orthopedic academy. It, it's probably not relevant that chiropractic was invented by an orthopedic surgeon, Dr. Garfield, out in California, minor point, maybe, who was the president of the North American Spine Society, minor point, maybe. <laughs> Vertebroplasty is uh, done far more commonly by interventional radiologists and everybody else. I, I, I think that it's a minor difference in that the <coughs> operator, meaning the person injecting the cement, is skilled and is watching where the cement goes, you're going to get equivalent results in, in my experience.